The Whips have agreed that item 20, the motion on housing, will be taken next. Can I ask Councillor White to move and Councillor Jones to second the motion in their names? Councillor White? I move the motion. Councillor Jones? Seconded. There is an amendment to this motion that has been circulated. Can I ask Councillor Govindia to move and Councillor Salier to second the Councillor Salier. Seconded. Thank you. There are speakers. I think you're first. Councillor Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. May I begin by adding my condolences to the victims of the Grenfell Tower fire. May I also congratulate you on your election as Mayor of Wandsworth and wish you a speedy recovery to full health, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, London house faces a housing crisis. When I joined Wandsworth Council in 2010, there were 350 homeless families. This year, they are expected to be 1,800, five times as many. Affordable housing, by which I mean housing affordable to a family on medium income, not some spurious figure invented by the editor of the Evening Standard, is almost unavailable in Wandsworth outside the social rented sector. Wandsworth Council is failing to achieve its playing target of 35% affordable homes in new developments. Most recently, accepting a loss of 250 affordable homes in the Battersea Power Station development on the basis of deeply flawed financial calculations. As a result, rogue landlords are now able to exploit some private renters in the borough by providing unsafe, insecure and expensive accommodation, threatening a return to the Rackman practices of the 1960s which we all thought had been long outlawed. What is the Wandsworth Tory response to this crisis? The leader's pathetic paper, this, building for Wandsworth people, full of motherhood and apple pie, but no specific action. Indeed, the only action Wandsworth Tories took was that two days after the Housing Committee had discussed the leader's paper, the Planning Applications Committee accepted a 250 reduction in the number of affordable homes on the Battersea Power Station site. At a stroke, they undid the work of over a decade of the Hidden Homes Programme. It is because of the way they contemptuously ignore the needs of Wandsworth people that I say that Wandsworth Tories are unfit to hold public office. At the borough elections next May, we will sweep them away. Taking not just the marginal wards of Queenstown, Bedford and Ellsfield, but Shaftesbury, St Mary's Park, Southfields and West Hill, which fall to the 10% swing we achieved at the recent general election. And we will not stop there. Our ambition is not just to take the council, but to wipe the Tories from the face of Wandsworth. Why do we want to do this? Not for ourselves, but for the people of Wandsworth. We want to replace the Tory values for the privileged few by Labour values for the many, not the few. As it says on our Labour membership card, we believe that by the strength of our common endeavours, we achieve more than we achieve alone. That is the fundamental difference in our world view. Tories believe in individual greed, Labour, in collective need. In our manifesto for 2018, we will set out in detail our housing programme to 2022 and beyond. Building on the pledges in our 2014 manifesto and the housing policies being developed by the Mayor of London in the London Plan. But in the meantime, Mr Mayor, this motion sets out four actions that we can take today. Actions which if the majority party were a civilised party, they could readily agree to. First, we need to ensure that our housing policies prioritise the needs of local people ahead of the interests of property developers and overseas investors. Yes, we need property developers and overseas investors, but they need to work in partnership with us. 
If Hammersmith and Fulham can achieve 50% affordable housing in Riverside developments, so can Wandsworth. Secondly, we need to reprioritise housing policy to observe the London Plan's affordability targets and incorporate its aspiration for 50% truly affordable housing in new developments. Thirdly, we need to make sure that deals with developers are fair and enforced. Because the majority of property development is financed by debt, the return to equity that the developer receives is much greater than the overall project return, typically 20%. Finally, while we welcome HMO licensing, we need to expand the licensing of landlords beyond HMOs to avoid the development of Rackman-style practices in the Wandsworth private rented sector. Councillors, if you really want to build for Wandsworth people, vote for this motion. Thank you. Councillor Sweet. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Well, I very much welcome Councillor Carpenter's enthusiasm for 35% affordable housing in Riverside schemes because, in fact, last month we, in the Planning Committee, approved uh, a Riverside scheme in Riverside Quarter that will deliver 36% affordable homes. Yeah. So uh, I look forward to welcoming you to the committee where we can pass many more schemes that achieve high levels of affordable housing. And the reason for that is that we're passionate in this council to deliver affordable housing for the people of Wandsworth. We have the second best record in London on affordable housing and this year we have been achieving 25 to 30 percent affordable housing in new schemes in Nine Elms. And that's why I want to explain the special circumstances around the Battersea Power Station approval given last month. So first of all a question, how much does it cost to restore Battersea Power Station? It's a difficult one to answer because it's a unique and challenging site and that's exactly why it's lain empty for 30 years. It's a listed building, it's full of chemicals, it's the biggest brick building in Europe. So when we first granted permission for Battersea Power Station, the experts said that the scheme would cost £750 million. Well, that's now doubled. I think it's fair we should know why that's happened, so I decided to ask the, de the developers. It's costing £500 million more now because of worse than expected structural problems and asbestos problems on the power station site. And it's costing an extra £200 million in, uh, in construction and insurance costs. So that's their problem, say Labour. But that's not right. It's actually our problem too because all councils in London have to follow the same rules which broadly say that affordable housing is what's left over once a developer has paid for new infrastructure and, uh, and once they've made a set profit on, the, on their development. And that's exactly why our neighbours in Merton, Labour Merton, and the Mayor of London approved the equally complex uh, Wimbledon Stadium scheme at 9%. So when Battersea Power Station first came back to us, they said the costs have gone up so much, £750 million, they've gone up so much that they couldn't actually afford to provide any affordable housing. And by the way, we checked their sums. So 0% was actually our starting point. And it was really through the heroic efforts of officers that we got up from 0% to 9%. That's the context for, for this discussion. We persuaded them, we did that by persuading the developer to accept a much lower level of, level of profit than would be normal on schemes of this nature. Labour's claim that the developer is still making billions on this scheme is 10 years out of date. They're using figures, as the leader of the council said, that, that are from a treasury holding company from 10 years ago. Uh, that assumed a huge increase in property prices. And if property prices had gone up that much in 10 years, we wouldn't be having this discussion now. So, yes, we could say to the developer, tough, no deal. But if we'd done that, it would force the investors behind Battersea Power Station to decide whether they want to put their money in a low-profit scheme in Wandsworth or take it elsewhere for better returns. And that would put the entire project at risk. Well, I can tell you that the people of the borough want that investment to stay here. Our residents need this scheme to succeed because it's bringing 17,000 new jobs, a new health centre, seven hectares of public space, 
the restoration of our most famous building, and it's paying for the Northern Line extension. So without the £245 million that Battersea Power Station is putting into the Northern Line extension, we wouldn't be having our tube built. I don't think the Mayor of London would be able to keep up the payments on the loan he's taken out to pay for it. So when I hear Labour telling us they say no to Battersea Power Station, I actually hear them saying they don't want a new tube in Battersea. I hear them saying they don't want new jobs in Battersea and they don't want new homes in Battersea. And I say new homes, yes, because this scheme is actually bringing 4,239 new homes for Londoners. 386 of them are affordable homes. Councillor, if you could wind up, please. Our residents need those homes now, and this will bring the delivery of the homes forward by three years. And that means people can move in to the homes that they so badly need. So, you know what? I think Labour would have done exactly the same thing if they were in our position. The Mayor of London was told about this, this happening on the 11th of April. If he'd cared that much about it, wouldn't he have written to me before the day of the committee? He called the Deputy Chairman of the Planning Committee disingenuous, but the Mayor is the one that praised our record on housing last year, and he allowed our neighbours in Merton to approve a similar scheme with 9% affordable housing. What impact would it have, and what message would it send if we turned down this scheme? We want the new homes, the new tube, and the new jobs that Battersea Power Station are going to deliver. Yeah. <laughs> Councillor Nardelli. So uh, there's been a. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I've listened and I've read the questions that have been asked to the leader. And I've listened to the debates from the opposition. I've also listened to the noise that I hear on the ground. And I'm horrified by what I hear. Out of date concepts with no other reason but to give a punch. And a punch, Mr Mayor, at the government that is still clearing up the murderous crimes committed by their government. And I am disgusted by the fake news that I'm hearing from Councillor Trumps. The continual lack of understanding for housing. I think the opposition is still living under a Labour government, a government that mismanaged a heated market. Labour stupidly and irresponsibly put an upper ceiling on housing benefits. That ceiling pushed up all rents. No consideration for size, amenity, condition or area, just a top price, which caused all low-end landlords to put their rents up to the maximum. All other landlords had to then follow. The second factor was the decision again by the same ineffectual government was to lower the discount on right to buys in 1997 a scheme where council homes after a three-year tenancy period could be bought by the tenant the discount was lowered again in 2003 to a painfully low 16,000 and nowhere was any dictate that the funds should be put into a replacement for a new home a tenant home can only hold one tenancy but a sold one can be creating another one. Simple economics of supply and demand, a concept that that government failed to understand, failing the population of this country and bringing it to its knees, where I say, hang your heads in shame. Rents, Mr. Mayor, have been dropping all of this year. Most of the people already know this. Elected members should be, by rights, in a position with this knowledge. It is utterly not true that rents are continuing to rise or property retail prices are rising in that area. So, Mr Mayor, I say it again, rents are not rising, public sector wages are rising, but central London rents are falling between 6 and 12%. Tenancy renewals are being negotiated in Battersea with a discount of between 5 and 15%. 37% of the rental properties in Battersea at the moment have already been discounted, and the average time of an offer is 74 days, although three months is now considered the norm with longer empty periods. And just to add to these statistics, 35% more stock is on the letting market in Battersea than last year. In Riverlite, a two-bedroom, two-bathroom flat, four sharers, has gone on the market at £2,050 per calendar month, a breakdown for a three-way split of £683, 33p recurring, down on last year's asking price of £908. So we are calming the market, a market that is finding its level. And this has been achieved by this government, 
A government that understands supply and demand, understands that people can make their choices. This government added a 3% surcharge to second home and buy to lets. This has slowed the market down by leaving the market more suited to owner occupiers. Properties that were banked for profits have been brought to the market and as prices have fallen, they've now been offered on the letting market, bringing down prices and rising accessibility to local people. This government has also raised the right to buy offer and a condition that each home is replaced like for like. Ones with council, ones with conservative council, have brought in more than 250 new council homes in the last 10 years. 67, some 50 odd in the Nine Elms area, are in the pipeline for completion. A model being adopted by Labour-run Hackney and Southwark. I wish our opposition party understood the simple practices instead of always voting them down. This council is on course to deliver 15,500 new homes, of which 1,400 would be social, affordable and immediate rent, and 1,250 would be for shared ownership. This gives an average figure of 17% affordable across Nine Elms. That, Mr Mayor, is 2% above the target level. And, Mr Mayor, this doesn't take into consideration the £60 million that's been given for off-site affordable housing. Which, is, which the Planning Committee has secured. Councillor, if you could wind up, please. Wind up. And stay in there, still complaining. The area around Nine Elms has historically predominantly been social housing, with the huge estates on the Savona, Patmore and Carry Gardens. I believe that this needs to be taken into consideration when mixing the figures up, along with the new infrastructure, including the Northern Line, which Battersea Power Station has given £1,212 million for. We do not want this to be the white elephant on the river, opposite the old white elephant on the river. <laughs> Councillor Dickenham. Dear Mr Mayor, the first time I spoke in this council chamber after being elected, I raised the issue of affordability at Nine Elms. I'd spoken to hundreds of residents in Queenstown who felt like the developments rising up around were not for them. And they'd soon be priced out of the area that they love. I called on the council to take seriously its obligations in making sure the developments taking place in Battersea would be for everyone, rather than just creating investment properties for the wealthy. In fact, my exact words were these. Let us be clear, when it comes to housing, we must be getting the best deal possible from developers. Seven months later, I'm confronted by a decision that frankly astounds me. This council that is supposed to represent and defend the interests of residents of Wandsworth has allowed 250 affordable homes to be all but scrapped by the Battersea Power Station redevelopment a project that was already outrageously unaffordable. We are now down from a pathetic 15% affordability to even lower 9%. The excuses given this evening are outrageous. Are you seriously telling us that you want to talk about hard choices when the housing that we're talking about is probably just around 1% to 2% of the overall costs of what is a multi-billion pound project? When the estimated profits are in the hundreds of millions? Let's be clear when we talk about viability. It's got nothing to do with whether this project can go ahead or not and it's got everything to do with how much profit the developers will make. The council's decision to side with the developers shows you're not only unfit to fight on behalf of our residents, but completely out of touch. Can you not see what the Battersea Power Station development is starting to represent to many in our borough? It's a symbol of inequality, of those catered to and those who are being left behind. Do you not get the same emails that I get on a daily basis? The families trapped in overcrowded accommodation, the parents sleeping on the sofa, the children of all ages four to a room, the people working hard in Battersea just to see all their income go on rent. We're creating a London divided up between precarious renters and ever wealthier landlords. And, dis and this decision, there are now 250 families that have just lost their chance at securing a decent home. And it shouldn't be taken lightly. How can you not see that making that a developer coming into your neighbourhood, making millions by building a luxury community, it's going to push prices up, it's going to push rents up, and to put it frankly, this is just frankly an anti-social thing to do. It seems like this council thinks development is good in of itself, that the market will facilitate the problem as long as we let developers just get on with it. This council seems to think it doesn't matter that a huge expanse of central London land is now going to be filled with luxury apartments, that the opportunity of a lifetime to build real affordable homes for our residents has been wasted, and that we should be grateful for what we get. We should be happy with a few homes here and there, some, tr some crumbs trickling down. I think it's a complete disgrace. What is clear is that the politics of the Conservatives are fundamentally unfit to deal with the housing crisis facing us. Free market solutions are not the answer. We need councils that are brave enough to intervene, 
to set affordable housing percentages that work for the public good and hold developers to account. We should be asking for 35% from private developer, developers. And what's happened at the power station, this 9% is cowardly. Of course the developers are going to say costs are increasing too much. They're private, profit-seeking entities. They're beholden to their stakeholders. The council is not fit for purpose if it thinks outsourcing to developers the power to set what is viable and what isn't will produce the best deal for the public. Viability assessment should be only used when the circumstances have made the council's requirements literally impossible. And this was not the case that was facing us. And even if this was the case, the details should be published so the public can scrutinise it. The fact these viability assessments are private, so we can't even see the deals that are being made and the figures being used is outrageous. What is there to hide? I'm going to say this straight up now. If Labour takes control of the council, these viability assessments will be made public so residents can see the evidence and decide for themselves. And don't come at me with Wandsworth's affordable housing record. Anyone in the real world knows that most of what is classed as affordable isn't worth that name. Start building council homes and properties with social rent. And don't come up with these examples from other boroughs. It's totally disingenuous for you to attack Labour councillors from the left, given your own policies and history. The Battersea Power Station has sent ripples across London. Things can't go on the way they are. The people won't have it. Local authorities need to wake up and start getting serious about the affordability crisis in London. This is a crisis that is causing misery to so many in Wandsworth. We have the power to change that, we just need the will. <clears throat> Councillor Clay. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, London's increasing population has pushed property prices sky high as demand outstrips supply. Buying a home today in Wandsworth is beyond the means of most locals. <laughs> there, there are these are potential my children. There are recent welcome signs of a cooling in the market, as Councillor Nardelli has, has already described, and rental rates are starting to dip. But for generation rent, the situation is far from rosy. An unacceptable proportion of Wandsworth residents spend far too much of their salary on rent. Newspaper headlines shriek about London's housing crisis and solutions are the mainstay of political debate. So I was really looking forward to the opposition's motion about Wandsworth's housing crisis, assuming I would find some bold suggestions, especially as they voted against the council's medium-term financial strategy on the grounds that they have different spending priorities. I wondered if they would rekindle some of Sadiq Khan's forgotten manifesto promises like a crackdown on the buy-to-leave phenomenon or the creation of a not-for-profit letting agency for the whole of London. I wondered if they would include suggestions on how Wandsworth residents could benefit from the £3 billion for 90,000 new and affordable homes that the Chancellor promised to City Hall last November. For a giddy moment, I wondered if they would brag about what Mr. Khan has done to solve London's housing crisis, but quickly realised there wasn't enough for a whole motion, let alone one with two paragraphs and eight subsections. Wandsworth's got ambitious plans to build even more properties on council land, ideas that Labour administrations in Hackney and Southwark have copied. No, nope, that's not in this motion, but why would it be? They voted against it. I was getting desperate. Surely there must be one bold idea. One from Croydon, maybe. No, nothing even about Croydon. I looked in vain for the big ideas. Ideas that they might have pinched, let's say from Jeremy Corbyn. Where was the proposed scrapping of the pay-to-stay policy, which means that well-paid council's tenants pay a bit more rent? Where was the abolition of the right to buy for tenants? I can't tell you how disappointed I am that they didn't include London Young Labour's proposal, which was to launch a massive program of affordable house building funded by the construction companies and private landlords, and the immediate nationalisation without compensation of the businesses and land necessary in the event that the private owners refuse to participate. <laughs> that would have livened up our debate, wouldn't it? <laughs> What we've ended up with is a horlix of emotion. A motion where Wandsworth's housing crisis is noted in 82 words and the solutions in just 61. 
There are no big and bold plans here, just a carping opposition devoid of ideas. Expanding the licensing scheme would mean more paperwork and expense for potentially thousands of landlords. The notion that this would be self-financing is absurd. If the council isn't picking up the annual cost of about a thousand pounds, then landlords will pass it on to their tenants. This isn't a measure that will improve life for local renters. It's not even a solution to the problems of rogue landlords. It's nothing more than a tenant's tax. I urge members to vote against this ill thought through motion and in favour of the amendment. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Govindia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I start by um, <coughs> congratulating Councillor Sweet on a superb speech uh, on the first of his speeches on since taking planning applications committee. Showed a distinct understanding of the process far better than uh, members opposite. Councillor Clay sort of uh, was looking for the motive behind this motion and hoping that some new light would strike uh, the opposition. Well, uh, she can carry on looking because I don't think this motion was intended to change minds and change hearts. This was a motion intended to make a point because they feel they have wind in their sails, which is understandable, but I think there is no purpose other than to just uh, parade what Councillor Carpenter sort of said. He's put in a new order for a yacht because the group is going to be bigger. That's what he wanted to talk about, and that's what he has had a chance to talk about. Let's also just reflect on what this council has done and where it has not been supported and where it has been supported. So Councillor Sweet mentioned that at the Council, at the Planning Applications Committee, there was a decision for 36% uh, affordable housing to be delivered on the Riverside Quarter Scheme. As I look at the minutes, it looks like it was done by majority party, but not without the support of the minority party. And you'd have thought that 36% was pretty good, but obviously not. Maybe they forgot that there was a different planning application, maybe they thought it was all about Batsy Power Station yet again. Mr. Mayor, 17, paper 17171, they don't think it's enough, but I would have thought that most people would say something is better than nothing, but not them. If they want to actually rewrite the rules in London planning, then perhaps we'll wait for the London plan review that the Mayor is coming out with. But until that plan review is out, agreed and in place, I'm afraid, Councillor Dickerton, the London plan stays, and it stays because it puts their viability as the key determinant when it comes to delivery of affordable housing. This is not Wandsworth's rule. This is a rule across all 33 London authorities. They have to take into account the, in, in the, the viability of a site before delivering the caution of uh, affordable housing needed. One place where the mayor could help, perhaps, and deliver more affordable housing and improve the profitability at, at Batsy Power Station would actually be if he didn't go for 240 million pounds of new design costs that have been added to the Northern Line delivery. So, in fact, that is one area where TfL could have said, well, we won't do this, we we'll carry on with the old design, we won't load that much money on your budget, and therefore, let's have some more affordable housing for it. Not a bit of it. It's about having everything in it. The point that the opposition needs to reflect on, particularly if they have ambitions of power, is to say that life is about making choices. And what choice will you make? When you want affordable housing, will you say no, as Councillor uh, uh, Sweet talked about, no to NLE, no to a linear park, no to, to jobs, no to a riverside pier, no to a cultural strategy, no to a place which actually is a place, no to Apple coming there and providing uh, vitality and buzz to, to that part of the borough. That is what responsibility means. And I'm afraid, Mr. Mayor, finally I'd say this. If the opposition think or anyone thinks that this party wholeheartedly went in and said, oh, well, let's go for 9%. It's all fine, you know. Well, let's go for whatever you like. Well, no, we are not idiots. We are not idiots. This is a politically difficult decision for us to have made, and one that took us 
well after October, which was when the first time it was floated with the Council, that it has taken this long to actually tease out, negotiate, and get to a point which is one that reflects responsible behaviour on our part. And finally, Mr. Mayor, complex and difficult planning, or whatever decisions, politicians should reflect that these are not sorted by tweets. They cannot be understood by tweets. Responsibility is in understanding the process. So my point to the mayor will be when I see him next, that he does need to sit down with the partners at Baxi Power Station and understand more properly what are the challenges that face them. What I think he needs to also do is to give a very clear message of support that whilst London is open for business, then investors will also come only if they feel welcome. <clears throat> Councillor White. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this motion recognises the real urgency of housing, the housing crisis in Wandsworth. There is not enough affordability here. People are forced to accept housing solutions that do not reach acceptable decency levels. The lack of social and low-cost housing have led to some of the highest rents and house prices in the country. And this council allows agreements with developers that prioritise massive profits, investment money boxes and easy options to renege on affordability agreements. The minority group have continually advocated licensing in the private rented sector to rid Wandsworth of substandard and dangerous housing. How is it that it has taken government legislation to extend the HMO licensing scheme in this borough? The current 695 licenses issued could double with this scheme, but there are 42,000 private rented households in Wandsworth. We would accept that in Wandsworth there are many good quality private renting, renting land, landlords. However, is it really only the larger HMOs that private renters are having issues with? Isn't it true that some wards in Wandsworth, including my own Tooting, have larger proportions of low-grade, sometimes hazardous private rented housing? And, and I make this point again. Isn't it true that complaints from residents about conditions lead to evictions, adding to the borough's homelessness? I hope I made that point clear now. We mustn't wait until an incident speeds action. We can extend licensing even further now, as in other London boroughs. The homeless in temporary accommodation will rise by over 15% this year, with over 2,500 children affected, a truly damning indictment of this council's housing policy. As the demand outstrips uh, supply, so even residents that would previously have expected to buy in this borough are unable to. Our own MP in Tooting falls into that bracket. Where are the affordable homes for young people earning £21,000 pounds or under yearly, and public and service sector workers may be earning just slightly more. Public service workers will receive a below the cost of living wage rise and many low and average earners continue to see their salaries st stagnate. Yet this council just waves through a variation to the 1.8 billion profitable Battersea Power Station development that will mean the very homes that these workers could afford will be in even shorter supply. Affordable homes are not high enough in this council's priorities. Priorities that can be summed up as profits for the developers and squeeze everyone else into what's left. And of course, let's not forget the invisible investors who never take up the opportunity to live in their homes and don't contribute to our community. What confidence can we have that developments that this council negotiates will deliver the expected outcomes? Will the borough's housing revenue account ever see the £150 million being spent on the Winstanley York Road joint venture development again? What of the other developments it has agreed? How long before this council has acquiesced to the demands of the developers for entrenched multi-million pound profits against the housing needs of the people of Wandsworth? At Nine Elms, the development agreement includes a 26 million infrastructure payment towards a bridge to add value to that regeneration. Were the people of North Battersea asked where, whether they want that or maybe more homes that they or their children can move to? The good people of the Savona and Patmore estates, covered in dust and muck, seeing this multi-million pound development rise and their status fall. 
Will they see their sons and daughters being able to take up residence there? Well, if the Mayor's affordable targets were adhered to, over 2,500 more affordable homes would be built and would help to alleviate their need and maybe the inconvenience would have been worthwhile. A Danish company will help that bridge design and I note that 44%, 44% of Danish rented accommodation are social homes compared with 18% in the UK. A central government grant for social and now affordable homes build has declined by 80% since 2010. This is hardly going to get better. Danish inspiration in housing as well as bridges, please. We need affordable and social homes now, plus a fairer, more regulated private rented sector so we can have richer, more harmonised experience where people are more equal and happier. Well, we have a party preparing for government that will deliver such an improvement and we also have a council in waiting ready to deliver a more balanced housing policy that will be for the many and not just the multi-millionaire developers and rogue landlords. Thank you, councillors. The decision for the council is that the motion as amended Ah, oh, apologies, yes. The amendment moved by Councillor Govindia and seconded by Councillor Salia. Please indicate by a show of hands those in favour of the amendment. Those against? Any abstentions? One, so that's yeah. carried 29-18-1. The amendment is therefore carried by 29 votes to 18 with one abstention. So moving on to the then substantive motion as amended. Yeah. Is it the same numbers? Same numbers? Yeah. Okay. So that's it's 29 in favour, 18, 18 against, and one abstention. The motion is therefore carried. <laughs> 